Welcome to the Everyday PM podcast, the podcast where we discuss project management principles for your everyday life. My name is Ann Campia, and I'm a certified project slash program manager with a decade of experience working for healthcare, retail, consumer goods, and tech industries. I'm so excited to welcome Brendan Baker, who is the author of the bestseller, Valuable Change, and consultant on over 10 billion dollar projects in key transformations and programs across a range of industries and organizational sizes. Brendan, you've also established the Valuable Change Company with one central mission in mind, which is to help change leaders drive real value. Uh, but on your way to your secondary mission, which is to fight unnecessary complexity. So I love that. I love the, the one-two combo you got there, Brendan. So um, why don't you take a brief moment to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I think you've actually covered half of it there, which is great. <laughs> but uh, uh, but yes, no, I'm I'm Brendan Baker. Uh, I'm actually based in um, well, somewhat sunny. It's currently dark because it's five a.m. my time here. But uh, so I'm based in Canberra, on the outskirts of Canberra, down in Australia. Uh, so coming coming to most of your listeners, I would imagine from a fair while away. Um, but yes, absolutely. Started the the Valuable Change Co. With, with really one, one key mission in mind, and that was to help change leaders drive real value. Uh, and, um, and it's because it's so easy to get caught up in the process. It's so easy to get caught up in the, you know, the templates or the reports or, or the documents or, or whatever, uh, whatever it is. And, and we really, um, when we're driving change, we really lose sight of, um, of, of why we're doing it and, mm -hmm. and what we're actually trying to achieve. Uh, and so that's what the Valuable Change Co. is designed to uh, combat. And as you said, uh, and counter some unnecessary complexity in the way, on the way. <laughs> I, I love that. And your, your mission and your, and what you believe in with, with the valuable change co is just very, very strong. And I think a lot of our audience will resonate with that as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts today. I think for today, we're going to spotlight you obviously, but we're also going to focus on your newest book, which is called high, high value PMOs. And I think in this environment, this current climate where we're seeing the P project management industry continue to shift and evolve and with the newest edition of the PEMBA coming out, the seventh edition, you know, with the focus of it really being on value-driven principles and how we can arrive there. Your book is so timely. Did you, I'll start there. Did you plan that? Did you plan for, for this to happen or is this a happy <laughs> coincidence? Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a master, master schedule. No, uh, <laughs> uh, in, in many ways, no. Um, so the, the book is really, um, the timing is a coincidence, uh, in all honesty, uh, but, but the book, uh, which, which I think we'll, we'll explore it, you know, throughout this discussion, but really this book is the result of, um, of I guess, my experience to date uh, and, and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work. Um, so it's, it seems like that there might just be a little bit of a, a value revolution happening at the moment and, uh, and, and happening all, perhaps all around the globe. Uh, so that's really the result of that. Yeah, I love that value revolution. I think that's absolutely appropriate. And I think a lot of us titled project manager or not, we're looking internally to, to say to ourselves, what is my value add to the organization? And in, in this respect, as we dig into your book, you know, what is the PMO overall? What is it, what is it adding to, to the organization overall? And if it's not doing that, why? Um, and I like that you dig into that, th that exact concept, because I think that's a question that we should all be asking ourselves right now. So I'm, I'm on that train, Brendan, about value revolution. I think we're there. So why don't we start with your background? I would love to hear, you know, how did you arrive at being a project manager? You also have a lot of experience that you're bringing into each of the books that you've written. So tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Uh, so it's, it's one of those funny things where um, fairly early on, I knew that my career was, was going to be guided by two principles. Uh, and they were just two things that were really, really important to me, or, you know, almost my, my value set. Uh, and, and the very first thing was that I knew that anything I did needed to be driven, um, driven, I guess, with purpose. Basically, I needed to help make people's lives better. Right. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, and I quite liked change. I was quite, quite adaptable. So I knew I was going to be drawn into that arena a little bit. Uh, and the second one was, um, was that I thrive on variety and diversity. So anything that I did had to, had to be different fairly frequently. Uh, new contexts, new people, new environments, new problems to solve. Um, they, were the, they were the values that's coming in. And, and I admit, uh, I actually grew up in a house in, in, a, in a low socioeconomic part of Sydney. 
uh, with with a mum that was a teacher and and a dad that had a trade. So there was no there was nothing I guess corporate about my uh, you know about my mm. upbringing. I had no exposure to it, but I knew that I wanted to get into that business world and crack into it. Um, and and uh, but with that value set, I was actually drawn to project management. Uh, the idea of, and, and, and I'm talking very, very, when I was drawn to, it was very cursory in my understanding, mm-hmm. uh, but it was really just the idea of something having a defined start and end date that was mm-hmm. highly appealing uh, right. because it built in that variety, it built in that diversity. Um, and so that's, to be honest, that, that's where I started. Uh, I, I went through, got a business degree and, and started as a graduate in a PMO of all places uh, yes. and uh, and kind of learnt the game from the PMO. And, um, and then the whole time I was there I was begging begging give me a project of my own give me a project of my <laughs> own I can do this I want to cut my teeth as you yeah. do when you have that that, that youthful exuberance you know, yes I'm, I'm invincible I can do it all uh and and I finally got one uh which, which was awesome I had a, had a fantastic mentor at the time and and got given a project to take on it was small um but tell you what I'm glad it was small the amount of mistakes I made on that thing <laughs> where uh where the list is endless um yeah uh, but, but nevertheless delivered it uh and um and so then the projects and programs, it, it kind of, all, as I said, you know, it's almost history. It, it, it cascaded in size. And, and so I've actually delivered either directly leading myself or consulting on um, in, in, or, or guiding in, in one way mm-hmm. or form projects, programs and portfolios in, in various sizes. Uh, we're talking everything from, you know, 50, 100K all the way up to a one and a half billion dollar portfolio uh, and, and everything in between. Uh, and Amazing. Uh, oh yeah it's, it's, it's good fun to be honest and, and across a range of different types of projects as well which which is really interesting uh, again meeting that that need for, for diversity um and we're talking process overhauls we're talking it systems new new and existing uh we're talking um restructures shared service implementations um call center uplifts uh what else have i done public infrastructure um so a whole heap of things but there's also been some really interesting unique ones as well uh, yeah. and, and it's funny because they're the ones that you get the really cool stories from uh, so so one of which was was actually uh, state archives uh, that basically that you know the people that have all of the documents that no one else wants to anymore unless they want to go and look at history um, mm-hmm. the problem was the the state archives they had a they had a deep deep I guess several warehouses of all of these documents uh, and they had no idea what they had. Uh, and, and the crazy thing is that's actually the, the status quo. That's the norm for the, for archives and libraries across the world uh, that they've only, in fact, the benchmark at the time was about 20% catalogued 80% of their archives are just boxes. They have no idea what they have. Uh, mm-hmm. Now this state archives in particular was sitting at 8%. Uh, accessible, 92% of what they had, they couldn't get to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the, the project was really throw there from their point of view, it was throw money at the problem to try to, uh, you know, get what they could there. And, um, and so it was quite interesting because it was essentially cataloging archives, but at scale. And when you, imp- when you implemented, and, and what I did is I implemented agile principles and a bunch of other things in there. Uh, sure. And and delivered uh, five and a half times their expected scope wow. uh, and blew them away. So they, they were targeting 100,000 archives and we did 550,000 in four months, uh, which was amazing. Um, so it's it's been a quite quite a unique journey, to be honest. Yeah, it's a, I mean, and your career, it, I feel like your career is, is not ending anytime soon. So this is just oh, a hope. plethora of, yes, this is just a plethora of, of, of very, very unique and different types of projects that you worked on. And I think, I imagine that's kind of what helped you write some of the books that you've already published in terms of your collective experiences there. But I want to go back to the very first thing you said, because it stuck with me, which is mm. you were probably the first person on this podcast to ever say you recognize that you like change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, you know, it's, it's, it for the everyday, even for the everyday person, right? Maybe you're not even a PM. This is just in your everyday life. Change can be very scary. And yes. I think when you are a project manager by title or not, that the, the trying to embrace change is something that can be very difficult for some people, which is also why you don't see everybody 
going into project management. I think when you recognize <laughs> that's what we do, you're, you either know, or you don't, that you can handle that type of pressure and that exactly. type of uh, flexibility and commitment, whatever else that you need to invest in yourself. And it just sounds like as soon as you cut your teeth on that first project, you are ready to go, Brendan. And that's amazing. And for those that are, you know, still starting out fresh in the industry, what is your recommendation actually in terms of you, you got the trust of your stakeholders to give you your initial project, but after that, what did you do to have to start to diversify your portfolio, like uh, everything that you've outlined to us? Yeah, uh, look, uh, so, and, and I don't know if this will be controversial advice or not, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest, but but I was, uh, I, I'm fairly... I was fairly aggressive in my career approach is probably yeah. the, the right way to put it. Um, and so whenever I saw the formation of, of a glass ceiling, uh, whenever I saw something in terms of, okay, uh, I'm no, I'm not going to, I mean, whenever there was a knockback, uh, you know, go for a project and, and don't get put on the position that, that I was looking to get put on or whatnot, I looked lateral. Uh, and and a bounce lateral essentially, mm -hmm. uh, and that that's that's what's really advantageous about the the project management industry, is because everything has to find start and ends. There's endless opportunity, and and it's funny, you know, you mention um, you mentioned change, and it's the old adage, you know, change is the only constant, and mm -hmm. and so because of that, the industry is not going to change too much in terms of that nature. There will always be opportunities, and so I would absolutely be in, in, be encouraging. Um, encourage people get as far as you can where you are uh, but look laterally it's okay uh, and and look for your next opportunity because that is the nature of the industry yeah that's great and and it's 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 such a great way to just make sure you continue di to diversify you don't necessarily have to always be looking up so I love that that's a great piece of advice for those that are trying to figure out you know how do I kind of unstick stick myself from being stuck with the same types of projects, right? Yes. So, um, but let's get back to, you know, in the span of your career, you've, it sounds like you've worked with different organizations, different types of structures, and now you've written this book on high value PMOs. So yes. is there a reason why your focus of the new book, your new book now is how to create uh, high value PMOs versus maybe one of the hundreds of other topics you could have written on? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, look, it, it is. Uh, and it really is the culmination of um, it's combination experience, but really there was almost a defining defining moment a few years back where I was brought on by a client to help mature their PMO and I jumped on uh, I jumped onto their basically their file archives because I was curious. Uh, and I was curious around what's the history here? Uh, how many you know, and how many attempts have they already had at, at setting up a PMO? Because you hear rumors, oh, that well, we've tried this in the past. And it's useful to know because it, it lets you know what level of change resistance you're likely to encounter when you're trying to roll out a new PMO. And so, you know, go and do a delve. And, and I saw that they've had six different attempts already oh over, over 10 years uh, at trying to do this. And so... I, I almost put on a, an archaeologist hat and I started to dig through the remains mm -hmm. uh, and, and a pattern started jumping out. So then I, I, I paid attention and that was kind of that little trigger and I paid attention at, at all of my PMO clients point past that point. I, I delved through what are the history and, and, and what are the patterns? And it, increasingly so, there was a pattern that kept jumping out to me. And it's something that I've termed the, the administrative death cycle, which, which is it's a, it's a grim name and, and, and I know that. Um, but really... Uh, it, it captures what's happening and I'll quickly walk you through it if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so typically what will happen, that cycle will start with, there'll be some kind of trigger point, normally a new executive or some sort coming in and the executive will look around and there'll be, there are projects underway and there's a whole heap of things going on, but there's no clarity. There's, um, there's a sense of um, chaos typically. And, and so they'll look around and they'll say, look, no one knows what's going on. We need a PMO. And so a PMO will get set up and the PMO will say, okay, well, we'll set up our charter and our mission will be, we'll drive consistency and visibility or something similar to that. And so they set up metrics and they set up reports and, and you know, a template library and a bunch of things. Um, and then a few months go by and the PMO looks around at all the projects and says, look, we, we've, we know where they're up to, but no one's improving. And so they say, no one's improving. We need more assurance. We need to tighten the screws more. And so they then, they basically increase the rigor. 
they, you know, tighter gates and uh, heavier templates, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and to the point where, you know, that progresses for a while, but it essentially gets to the point where the projects start to uh, say, look, this is getting overly cumbersome. Yeah. And, and we're no longer able to focus on, on the delivery, but we're, we're stuck focusing on uh, the, all of the PMI processes. And it gets to the point where uh, essentially they start subverting the processes. Mm-hmm. And and they start finding shadow walkarounds, or they ask for forgiveness, uh, you know, after the fact, just so they can still get their projects done. Uh, and and the process essentially um, don't meet the needs of the organization. And someone right. somewhere with enough clout says to an executive, "This PMO, they're not adding any value. They're expensive and they're cumbersome. Why do we have them?" Mm. And ultimately, the PMO is disbanded. And yep. then the organization stays like that for a little while until a new trigger point, a new executive comes in, looks around, sees chaos and says, we need a new PMO or we need a PMO. Uh, and the yeah. cycle kicks back off again. And, and I, I saw that. I saw that across that as I delved through the, my, the, the history of these client sites, I saw this cycle happening again and again and again. And you can see it, you know, the, the templates and the gateway documents and all of these things oh, get yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and, and so I wrote this book because I saw that and I also saw what was working both in the PMOs that I was implementing, but also the PMOs uh, that, that, you know, that I'm working alongside of um, on, on other projects and other change. Mm-hmm. And it was essentially what I termed those high value PMOs. And they had broken out of the cycle. And the way to break out of the cycle really is uh, at a fundamental point, but you can do so anytime your PMO exists, but it's really okay. it's a shift in thinking. And the thinking is, instead of thinking the projects aren't improving, we need more assurance, the shifting, the shift of thinking is the projects aren't improving, how can we improve capability? And how can we better support them? And how can we better serve them? And when you have that shift in thinking, you're no longer thinking about tightening the screws and making harder gateways and, and you know, trying to, I guess, force them through a, a tight and nasty funnel. Uh, but, but you're now thinking about, well, this is, this is my client base. How do I <laughs> help them achieve success? And you enter what I call the high value service cycle. So you start with, with, with the clarity of who you're serving. You start with clarity of why you exist. And then you essentially pivot around a very simple cycle, which is you're delivering services and support for your, your internal clients, which are typically executives and project managers and, and whatnot. And then you look, then there's a, a point of self-reflection. How can we better serve these people? How can we tighten the screws on ourselves in terms of um, minimizing our own effort while maximizing reward to these, uh, to these groups and then cycle within there. And that, that is where a high value PMO exists. And so you've come in, you've recognized this, you've kind of, as, as you said, like an archeologist or <clears throat> excuse me, like a, a medical doctor, you've come in and essentially kind of got down to what is the prognosis of the, of the client. How do you have that conversation to say, I recognize there's some mistakes that your PMO is making. How do we step mm-hmm. back and, and take a look at that? What is that conversation like? Uh, so it's, it's funny. It's the kind of thing that uh, I typically tell the story of the cycle. And, and if yeah. this is a person that has been around projects and change for, for at least a few years. I mean, when I was telling the, the story of the cycle here, you, you were there nodding your head. Oh, yeah, uh, because yeah, I was, lived through one as well. I, that exactly, absolutely yes. resonated with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. The most people that have been around change and projects have, have likely seen this. And yep. so as soon as, you, as soon as you tell the story, and storytelling is very powerful, and I might touch on that later, but um, as soon as you tell the story of, okay, well, this is the typical life cycle of a PMO, um, you see that, that recognition. You see that little, the lights go on, and then you, mm-hmm. you draw a little exit path for them. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, I love whiteboards. I don't have one here, but I love whiteboards, and I'll typically put, in, you know, put it in front of them. And then you draw the little exit path, and you say, this is where we should be exiting and this is where we should be existing instead uh and to be honest that gets the 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 conversation happening uh rather sure. quickly and, and really clearly oh absolutely yeah and i exactly nodding my head for that exact reason as you were telling that story i recognize that i have that exact same story in my history as well <laughs> and it and, and and it's unfortunate because you know when i was starting out one of the pieces of advice that i i don't know if it's advice it's really just kind of a statement that was made to me as a project manager was you know are you sure you want to be in this role because usually when organizations start to find faults they look at their pmo first and that 
is usually the group that gets targeted first or gets cut first. And it was just a very real conversation I had early on in my career about, is this something that you, do you are you okay with this type of instability? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not doing a great job, but it could be some sort of organizational change that forces the PMO out. And so your story is absolutely hitting home for me. I'm sure for those that are listening as well, they can think of an example or have lived through that as well. So I can see how that conversation can become very, very easy for you as you put your, <laughs> yes. your visual in front of these stakeholders and talk through it. So that's, that's wonderful. What about, you know, you talk a little bit about, is this the biggest mistake that PMOs make? Is there a laundry list of things that you kind of put in front of the stakeholders to say, here's X, Y, and Z where I think we're failing. What does that look like? Uh, great question. Great question. Uh, so there are typically four, uh, I, I call them cultural traps uh, that, that PMOs can fall into. And, and I'll probably, I'll delve into a little bit more detail on a couple of them. Uh, um, but the four traps are essentially, number one, building an ivory tower. Uh, you know, this, this idea of the PMO being better than everyone around them and having the, the ultimate source of truth on all things. Um, the second is uh, not getting the, the balance right between um, dictatorial uh, type of, a dictatorial approach, or what mm -hmm. I call a dictatorial monopoly, uh, or a benevolent monopoly, as in uh, they'll try to be all things to all people or there'll be no things to anyone. Um, uh, th the third trap is uh, stagnation. Uh, which is essentially a disconnect between your, your PMO and the context of your, your environment. You're no longer providing value because essentially you're disconnected from them. And, and it's because you've been left behind. And that's that stagnation. Um, or the fourth element is that they're paralyzed by fear. And there's a multitude of fears that, that uh, I guess, uh, affect us uh, in our organizations on day-to-day -day life. And we're humans, we're, we're, we're yeah. quite fallible. Uh, sure. And so it's, it's the inability to move forward because we're stuck, stuck in fear. Um, but, but there's two, I mean, to bring this back, I want to talk about the first two more so here. Um, the first is the, the building the ivory tower mentality. Now that typically manifests in, in one of two ways. The first is an us and them style um style approach or a style of thinking or culture within that can be built into your into a pmo and i'll give an example here uh, a client a pmo client a few years back brought me in to help mature their pmo processes and on the very first day that i was there uh the second in charge of the pmo came up to me and as part of the i guess the initial debrief her initial debrief to me she said the, projects, the project managers in this organization are all idiots and they don't know what they're on about. Uh, that in itself Yikes. was, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. And, and so that in itself is, was, was proof of this us and them. This, it was immense us and them style mentality. It was very adversarial. Uh, and it's that, that, I mean, that's the epitome of it, but I've seen it many, many times. Uh, and so that's, that's a key way that an ivory tower mentality can start to um, encroach in our PMOs. The other way that the ivory tower can turn up is through what I call um, academic self-gratification. And you'll have to excuse the, you know, the cheeky title, but um, essentially, and I've got an example here as well, but that's essentially being so obsessed with having your own things perfect that you lose touch of reality. Okay. Uh, and, and an example here is, uh, again, it was a PMO client brought me in to actually look at uh, and improve their assurance programs. Uh, but when I got in, I, I saw that they had all of these frameworks on, on basically in their file structure. They had all of these frameworks and templates and uh, they'd been sitting there refining these frameworks and templates for 15 months mm -hmm. and none of them had been rolled out. None of them had any, you know, basically no project manager even knew that they existed. Uh, no program. No, the, the, this was a multitude of portfolios under sitting under this EPMO, and uh, no one knew that these frameworks existed because this EPMO kept spinning their wheels and and basically getting more and more academic. That they were all experts at the textbooks, uh, and they wanted to build the you know the the, the silver bullet, the perfect framework, uh, and in doing so, essentially rendered themselves useless for that fifteen months. And wow. again, yes, yes. Uh, so again, ivory tower. 
because they were trying to build the, you know, the, the perfect uh, solution. Uh, and so the, the ivory tower is interesting because it's actually counted quite easily. It's counted quite simply. Um, it counted through two ways, empathy and experience. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, that makes sense. Yes. And so what I've found is that majority of these ivory tower PMOs are staffed by people that haven't necessarily delivered a project before. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're coming from somewhere else and they go, Isn't hey, you know, funny? you're good. Sorry? Isn't that funny? Yes, just, yes. Yes. <laughs> just, I don't know. I guess I have to laugh or otherwise I cry knowing that, but that, I think that is absolutely yes. true. Yes. And, and, and you can't blame them because they're essentially, they come in from somewhere else. They're good at processes or they're good at people or something. Um, and they got give it a handbook. Look, you know, this is project management. Here's your textbook, read that. And then I want you to make sure other people can do it. That's mm-hmm. essentially their brief. Uh, and, and so th- th- they come from it, you know, using that as using that textbook often as a point of truth, um, but they get stuck. And so empathy and experience is absolutely the counter. Uh, what, what's really cool is that you can build in processes and, and very simple processes into almost any PMO to build in that empathy and experience to counter that ivory tower, no matter where you are on um, in your life cycle, your PMO life cycle. And so the first thing you could do to build in empathy is co-design. And so get the stakeholders in the room. If you're working on a template, if you're working on a, on a report, if you're working on a process, if you're refining it, if you're doing reflection, whatever, whatever it is, get the stakeholders in the room with you. You'll start to immediately build empathy. Um, that's, that's the first one. Very, very insanely simple, but people aren't doing it. Um, the second one is, is around experience. And so the, the key process that you could be looking at there, and this is highly effective, is you look at building in some form of um, shadow ro- shadowing or rotation. And so you rotate the PMO staff out into the delivery. Uh, you give them a project to run uh, or three, or you have them shadow people that are running projects. Um, and then you cycle project managers into the PMO. And when you get that cycle happening, you're getting the fresh blood in straight, you know, straight from the coal face as such. And so you're getting the, the scars and, 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 the, and the experience with that and embedding that in, which helps your continuous improvement. Uh, but you're also... Uh, keeping that experience cycle happening and you're breaking those that, that could rely on the textbook overly much when they get into reality and they say, look, I don't have time to manage all of my different, you know, 300 different logs. I don't have time to do this because I'm busy fighting fires all day. And then maybe I'll, you know, update a risk at the end of the day or, or you know, run a retrospective or, or whatnot. Um, they get that sense of the imperfection in the reality mm-hmm. of running a project uh, mm-hmm. because there is never enough hours in the day. When you're running enough, when you're running a project, and so that really is that ivory tower counter. You put the empathy, you build in that empathy, and you build in that experience. Um, yeah. The second mistake I'll, I'll touch on um, fairly quickly as well um, is really that um, it's this finding this balance in terms of the type of monopoly you want to run, because the majority of PMOs are running an internal monopoly, and that's not a bad thing. In sure. that. What, what they are doing, uh, ideally you want to be in that place because that means there's not duplication throughout the organization. So you yeah. want to be running a monopoly, um, but with great power comes great responsibility, right? Love that line. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so a, a high value PMO finds the balance between, um, I guess, dictatorial and benevolent. So mm-hmm. a dictatorial monopoly is one that is, uh, would reject forms or reject processes or gateway submissions because of spelling errors, right? That like, that's the absolute, uh, you know, high end of this command and control style dictatorial monopoly. The other end of the world is the PMO that doesn't know how to say no. Yes, we can do it. Yes, we can do it. Yes, we can do it to the point of never being able to get anything done. And so a high value PMO is one that strides the two and finds what I call the, uh, the balance in what I call the, the responsible monopoly in that they're, they're continually asking themselves three key questions. They're asking themselves, how do we maximize the reward to our client groups, our internal client groups? Mm-hmm. How do we minimize the pain of dealing with us? And how do we minimize our own effort in delivering our internal services? And when you ask those three questions, you're really, you're, you're, you're getting that lovely positioning between the two because you're focused on this is what we do and we know what we do. 
we're clear on that. And then we're continually looking at ways to do it better, both for our clients uh, and for ourselves. And, and for that's, that's the angle forward. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that's great. It, because it's, it's, it really does have to be some sort of reciprocation on both sides of the, the coin, right? I, I don't know if that's the right saying, but uh, yeah, it absolutely makes sense that you should be looking to, to do that across the board. So um, I think all of these resonated again, because you saw me nodding my head again, <laughs> as you're telling yes. these stories. And I'm like, uh-huh. Yep. I remember that. I remember that also happening. So <laughs> I imagine if we saw the audience that's listening to this podcast right now, they would also be nodding their heads as well, because it's, you're just saying all the things that I feel like as project managers, we have experienced, we just never, I don't know. I just never really put it together that that could be, you know, the, the, the trend across multiple different PMOs, you know, but since you've had that perspective, it's fantastic that you've had, a, you know, the, the opportunity to now kind of see that that is an actual common trend across those PMOs that you've seen that are failing. Um, and it's really, really fascinating that it is, you know, down to those simple things. It, it really kind of is that simple, uh, the way that you've outlined them in your book. So, uh, it's, it's just interesting. It's just hitting, it's hitting the part of my head that I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about it in that way. So then, you know, you talk about, these are the areas that you would bring up to the, the stakeholders. This is potentially why we're failing as a PMO. Now let's talk about kind of the great side of things, right? Like what have you seen the most successful PMOs do right? And, and what have you, what have you actually also had a hand in, in to help those PMOs get there? Absolutely. Again, uh, awesome question. Uh, so really, high value PMOs are, are very, very clear. And, and they're clear on a couple things. In particular, they're clear on why they exist. They're clear on who they serve. They're clear on the value that they offer to those people that they serve. And they're clear on how they offer that value. That's, that really is, you know, in, in many ways, that's the secret. Uh, it, it's it's being uh, and and it being clear and, and achieving that clarity up front or as early as you possibly can. I mean, we've talked about the admin death cycle. We've talked about breaking out of that, um, but it's it's building in that clarity and that mentality in terms of a PMO it is ultimately and whether or not the PMO is including delivery or not in into their model, it's ultimately a service driven part yeah. of an of the organization and should be. Uh, and so, it's building in that clarity and asking yourself, uh, you know, who are we serving? Uh, who are our internal client groups? And how do we, how do we max, well, sorry, what do they need uh, from us to succeed themselves? Uh, what value does that give them? And how do we best serve that? And, and you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, what I've had a hand in. Um, what I often recommend in this space is actually codifying it, doing that mapping process, uh, you know, getting the stakeholders, getting those internal client groups in the room and say, look, this is what we think you need, uh, but let's actually work through this uh, and, and doing that mapping process with them and then codifying that initially into uh, an internal service map mm -hmm. and making that available. And, and it's, it's funny, um, what I'm talking to a lot of newer PMOs about now is, you know, I mentioned the value revolution. They're starting to understand, okay, yes, we need to be offering value. And some of them uh, are going, yes, you know, we're, we're fairly fit for purpose. We're nice and aligned. And so I'm starting to talk to them around push versus pull services. And at the moment, most PMOs that I've at least uh, am talking to are still pushing services out. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the template, here's the framework, here's this. They're pushing it out to their internal groups. Um, while I, I'm chatting to them about what would a pull service look like here? How do you make your offering so appealing that your internal client groups are actively going to want to use it, actively going to want to seek you out. Right. Uh, and, and, and not just the people that are seasoned, uh, you know, like yourself, who would see the value in a PMO just because you understand why they exist and, and, and whatnot, but, you know, the newbies as well. How do you make yourself valuable to the newbies? Mm -hmm. Or how do you make, yeah. so, make, make yourself valuable to the executives who have, you know, barely a moment to spare? Uh, and and it, it's finding... Uh, really finding and maximizing that value to your internal client groups. How challenging has that conversation been? Because I think um, the, the way you've, okay, so I'm going to go back to your story because it's so still so vivid in my mind. If this is a cycle 
and you know, you're, you're, um, prescribing the medication to the patient of what you need to do to kind of essentially get out of the cycle. You've talked about what makes a PMO great. Now, some PMOs I think can plateau or something like that, where now you're talking to them about, well, here's an, here's an area of push pull where we can continue to maximize our value add to the company. It's, it's this idea of like continuous improvement, even in, within ourselves, individuals, projects, groups, et cetera. Now we're talking PMO where I'm going with this is PMOs can absolutely just get stagnant in what they're doing. Right. Uh, especially the best of them. And so when you're having this conversation with the kind of the best of the PMOs that you work with, and you're saying, well, actually there's another area we haven't dug into yet. How receptive are they to that? Are they kind of pushing back and saying, no, we're good. You know, Brendan, you've done enough for us. We're good. You can leave us alone. Or <laughs> are they pretty open to that? And, and then have you seen that change actually happen? Uh, yes. Yes, I have. Um, and, and there's there's a primary tool that, that I use in, in that space. Uh, and so I actually fundamentally typically um, offer these PMOs a challenge. And I, I've, I've got a model that's in my other book, Val that Valuable Change, called The Learning Levels. And essentially... We are, uh, any organization, any branch, any unit, whichever way you slice and dice this, is at one point of one of three learning levels. They're either A, ignorant, and I'm not calling them ignorant as such, but in terms of their learning processes, they're ignorant, uh, or they're B, intelligent, or they're C, wise. Now, an ignorant organization or branch or unit, or in this case, PMO, uh, is one that doesn't know what they're learning and doesn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. A intelligent one has vast files, vast, you know, digital files uh, of all of the things that they've learned, uh, but they don't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a wise one knows what they're learning, knows where it's stored, knows how to search it, and ultimately uses it, uses it for forecasting and, and finds ways to prove it. Um, and so, you know, we we're talking about, you know, how do I have that conversation? Typically, I put those three, le those learning levels, again, on a whiteboard, or, or as a minimum, I describe it to them. Uh, and, and I say, where do you think you are? And, and what's really scary about the PMO arena, in, when we're chatting stagnation, when we're chatting learning, is the majority of them are sitting in the, in the ignorant box. Mm, uh, and, and, it's be and it's interesting because le the whole idea of lessons learned is, or, you know, and, and even through with Agile, you know, retrospectives, um, the whole idea there is that projects learn from other projects and, and we continually learn. Uh, and that's built into no matter whatever methodology you're using in the project arena, that's built in. Um, now, whether or not they're actually being used and they're actually wise is a slightly different conversation, but either way, it's built in. Uh, the PMOs, which are supporting that delivery, uh, aren't building in that same lessons learned or, or retrospective or looking back style of, or they're not building in reflection typically mm -hmm. into their own processes. So they're expecting, in fact, I've seen this quite often where the, the frameworks will say, you know, every project as part of their gateway review must have X, Y, Z lessons learned log, must, you know, must incorporate into their closure report, must report it in, in you know, included in yeah. whatever the template is. Um, but then they don't do anything like that themselves, uh, which, right. which <laughs> blows my mind uh, a little bit, uh, which, which is really interesting. So we're, we're chatting about, you know, how do we build that learning in? And really there's, there's three key elements that I've found that are highly effective at, at building that in. First of all, consider where you are on the, le on the learning levels uh, mm -hmm. and, and think about, well, how do we move ourselves up those levels? But then it comes down to three key elements the first is the right frame and uh and the right frame here is that a lesson log is not a lesson learned just because you've written something down or it's sitting in a report somewhere doesn't mean that the organization has actually learned from it yeah very true <laughs> and and so it's it's really building in that idea of learning proof how do we actually prove that we've learned this? And the way you prove it is typically by not doing it again or doing it again, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and, and so it's thinking around, uh, you know, it's almost bringing in this, this benefits management or this proving style thinking in mm -hmm. terms of, okay, well, we've got all these lessons here. 
um, and maybe the top three are X, Y, Z, how do we make sure we, we learn from that? And how do we prove that? And it's starting to get that proving type of thinking into the lesson arena, which, which um, I, could, I could almost say, you know, hand on heart that 90% um, of the people I talk to aren't doing. 95% people aren't thinking in that way. Um, and because it's a challenge and it takes time, but ultimately it's worth it. Uh, now, the second element here is the right context. Now, the right context here is one of, uh, I, I talk a little bit about a culture of openness and it comes through in my books, but it also, you know, comes through in my conversations is I often talk to organizations about building in a culture of openness. And so you want a culture where, um, you know, you're funding growth, you're funding experimentation, you're, you're funding that, and you want to allow that within your PMO. You want to allow your PMO to make mistakes. And in fact, when I, when I talk learning, if you look at any organization, any branch that's learning well and, and growing well, ultimately it's doing three things. It's failing and learning from it. It's succeeding and it's learning from it. And it's forecasting and reflecting and it's learning from that too. And so you build those in and you normalize failure and you normalize success. And there's really simple ways to do that. Uh, you know, have a failure session. Uh, here in, um, in Australia, do we, I think I'm sure you, you might have it over there. You've got this idea of, of a wooden spoon where you celebrate the person that came last. Uh, and so, you know, and, and you're not necessarily ridiculing them or anything like that. It's, it's, a, it's okay to fail and, and yeah. you're still part of the family. And, and in fact, so, something I have rolled out actually is, uh, what I call failure sessions, where you get the team together into the week, and and you all uh, quite openly, and in a light-hearted way, express your biggest failure of the week, and what you learned from it. I love and, that. And you go that go around the room, uh, and, and you, it needs to be light-hearted. And it's like that's a massive caveat on that one. It has to be very light-hearted. And it like if you have a culture that's um, has a tendency to become condescending, do not go anywhere near that. Uh, sure. not, not yet. You've got, you've got a bit of a journey to go first. Um, but if you have a high functioning and a very um, you know, open and, and lighthearted team, it's a highly effective way to normalize that failure and, and that normalize that learning in that. So, so bring that back, right context. You need, to be, you need to be funding and you need to be, more importantly, building in that culture of openness, which sure. is happy to fail, happy to succeed, and happy to reflect. The third element you need to be building in as part of a learning PMO is having the right conversations. Now, uh, you know, and, and don't come after me with pitchforks for saying this, uh, but the, the vast Never. majority of uh, <laughs> lessons learned sessions that I've been in have been boring. Mm -hmm. They've been dry and they're typically railroaded one of two ways. You typically have a couple of people in the room who, um, who are louder than the rest and they drive the conversation either to this project was absolutely amazing and did everything right or this project was an absolute mess and here's all the mm -hmm. things that went wrong. Right. Um, as it, again, you're nodding. So, so I feel <laughs> like, you know, you might have, uh, have experienced yes. similar, similar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so th there's actually an, an, alter an alternative way to have that conversation. Uh, in fact, to actually build it in. And so there's a concept called learning journeys. Um, I'm not going to claim credit for that. Um, it's, uh, I've picked it up on my journey somewhere. I don't know where, um, but it really, it leverages the power of storytelling. So, you know, we humans, before we could write, we've been telling stories for, for even longer than that. Uh, it's, it's a primary mechanism in terms of how we communicate with each other. And, and so when you're able to leverage that storytelling in, in what you're doing, you, you mentioned earlier, how do I explain the admin death cycle? Well, I tell the story, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a similar to way that I've just done, you know, here. It's, it's, and it's the same with our learning. If we build in learning journeys, into, into our projects, into our PMOs, then we're able to move past that dryness and you start shifting it. And, and so I'll quickly explain to you what I'm talking about here. Um, if you imagine a, imagine a whiteboard and imagine a horizontal line on a whiteboard. Again, I said, I like, light, I like whiteboards, um, but imagine a horizontal line. Everything above the horizontal line is a positive, a positive plot point. And everything below the horizontal line is a negative plot point. Uh, 
And what you do, okay. you, you get your teams and you get your PMO or you get your project uh, in the room and you say, let's tell the story of our last two weeks, of our last sprint, of our last month, whatever, whatever time frame, let's tell the story. And, and so you start to, rather than saying what went well and what didn't go well and, you know, how, do we, how could we have done cost management better or, or whatever the case may be, you start telling a story as a team. Oh, this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. And it, it becomes a little bit event driven, but ultimately the team is telling the story. Mm -hmm. And then after you've got the story all mapped out and it's a wonderful novel, typically of highs and lows, and it's, it's wonderful. Um, you then layer that with, okay, well, what did we learn? What do we learn from this? What do we learn from that? You know, what are the key things that are coming out? And so you're not no longer asking what went well. You're saying, what did we learn from, from this event in our lives that we all went through together? Right. And, and it's a different conversation. And you build that in, not at the end of a stage or anything else, but you build that in throughout. And you have that as, as a regular cadence. And again, that normalizes this idea of learning. I love that. I love that. And, and, and often we forget at the end of the project what everything happened anyway. So to yes. build it into your normal cadence, it just makes much more sense in that way. And to your point, storytelling is a lot easier to palletize, if that's the right word, easier to intake <laughs> than, than uh, you know, somebody pointing a finger at you, telling you what you did wrong the entire project. So those are all great pieces of advice, Brendan. And I also think in our everyday lives, we can also it, it, just take PMO out of the kind of everything that Brendan just said right there. You can also capture a lot of those, uh, that guidance and those tips and things like that when you're trying to figure out your own purpose in your everyday life, you're right. Uh, trying to figure out what you could do better in your day, what, how you could be more productive, whatever it is that your goals are for your personal lives, you utilize that advice as well. But then also in your professional lives, if you're a PM, PM or not, you know, encourage your organizations to get behind these types of practices and, and also do them in the way that Brandon said, because at least then it's, it's a lot more fun than just sitting in a room bored out of your mind while, you know, two people in the room <laughs> talk about what went well and what didn't. So absolutely, Brendan, I love all of that piece, all of that, that you just said, I think, I hope that the audience is able to capture that as well and start to utilize some of that uh, framework within their organization. So that'd be fantastic. But Brendan, I think you've given us a lot to think about. I can probably <laughs> pick your pick your brain about this the entire day, which I know we each also respectively have very busy days ahead of us. So I want to first thank you for your time to join us on the Everyday PM podcast, because I know it's an early day for you, early start for you. So first it and is. foremost, thank you for that. Um, but in terms of people who are interested in picking up any of the books that you've published and in hearing more of that practical advice and things that they can utilize uh, within their respective careers and uh, lives as well, where can they find your books? Uh, so I'm at valuablechange.com, uh, but in all honesty, my books are Amazon, Google, and any way you want to look for them. Uh, okay. Creating high value PMOs is both paperback and audiobook. Uh, and, and valuable change is uh, is paperback, and depending on when this comes out, maybe audiobook by then. The audiobook is currently uh, currently being recorded uh, and should oh, be out fantastic. by the end of twenty twenty one, which which is awesome. Uh, yeah, so, that's so super look, that, That's where I am. Um, I'm very very highly accessible. Uh, send me an email. Um, send me a question. I'm absolutely happy to always happy to have a chat. Always uh, happy to help wherever I can. Uh, and and it's funny. Uh, you mentioned that you know it, it's applicable in our everyday lives, uh, and and it's mm -hmm. interesting because that's not the first time I've received that feedback. In fact, I mm -hmm. handed my grandfather a copy of, of Valuable Change, my other book, um, and uh, my grandfather has nothing to do with with change management, nothing to do with project management, nothing to do with yeah. change leadership, nothing about that. Um, but you know, he understands enough of of the of the of the corporate world to get what I'm chatting uh, about. And he read that and he said, basically, you know, majority of this is applicable to my everyday life. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> it's, you know, with change or not. Uh, and so that's um, it's a wonderful piece of feedback, uh, but, but highly recommend uh, picking it up. And I'm curious to see if it's the same for your listeners. 
I agree. And, and my listeners are all over the place, right? So not necessarily project managers by trade, by title, none of that. They're just here listening in just to get that practical advice. So yes, absolutely. I think both of your books will serve great, tremendous value to our audience. So thank you for sharing your knowledge on that. I think Brendan, you're also on LinkedIn. So I'll make sure that um, the connection is made there with our audience as well, if they want to connect with you there. Um, anywhere, other platforms that you wanted to promote before we, we call it today? Uh, I'm primarily, in, in all honesty, I'm primarily on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Facebook as well, uh, but LinkedIn is really where I hang out more, uh, in, all, in all honesty. Um, I do also have a weekly newsletter, uh, which is the Change Leader Weekly. Um, so if you want to hear whatever I'm thinking about that week, uh, then jump on that. Uh, that's, that's, to be honest, it's rapidly growing in terms of readership, which is brilliant. Uh, it's, and it's nice. a nice sign, uh, and that, that's growing quite organically. So highly recommend uh, jumping on that as well. That's great to hear. Yes. I, and I will make sure all the links, anything that Brendan just promoted is all accessible on this post when this podcast goes up as well. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn as well. That is also my community. I live and breathe there too. Um, and so also support the Everyday PM podcast. We are available on every podcasting platform there is, especially Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, you name it feel free to check us out, subscribe, follow, whatever it is that you have to do to support. Um, you can see the video version of this on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ancampia. So if you want to just see us talk, you can too. Um, and also go ahead and subscribe, follow, do everything that you can to support me there. So that will do it for Brendan and I in this installment of the Everyday PM podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And until next time, take care.